This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Nearing new highs, the market sits close to a record and individual investors haven't been this upbeat in stocks in a while. Billions at stake, Apple and Qualcomm meet in court as the two tech titans argue over a long simmering patent dispute. Tax day, it is time to pay Uncle Sam. But who owes the most and who got the biggest break? Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, April 15th. Good evening, everyone. Bill Griffith is off this evening. Don't look now, but the major averages are sitting near all-time highs. This despite today's dip. Earnings from Goldman Sachs and Citigroup did little to inspire buying among investors, and we'll have more on that in just a moment. But first, the closing numbers. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was down 27 points to 26,384. The Nasdaq fell eight, and the S&P 500 was off one. But investors have been inspired this year. The Dow is up 13 percent, driven by a switch in the Fed's outlook, a drop in the likelihood of a recession, low unemployment, and healthy sentiment. And that sentiment is being seen among individual investors. According to the American Association of Individual Investors survey, expectations that stock prices will rise over the next six months jumped to 40.3 percent, rising above its historical average for the first time in six weeks. A recent E-Trade survey had similar findings. And joining us now to discuss all of this rising bullish sentiment is Nancy Tangler, chief investment strategist with Butcher Joseph Asset Management. Welcome back, Nancy. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Sue. It's good to be here. So what do you attribute the rise in sentiment and therefore the rise in stock prices? Well, I don't want to be cynical, but oftentimes uh, investors feel most bullish, uh, particularly individual investors, after the market has gone up uh, for an extended period of time. And so I think what you're seeing is sort of um, the other side of the equation of what we saw in December. Um, unfettered pessimism there, then and now, um, at least maybe not unfettered, but certainly optimism. So I, I don't think it's um, the right time for investors to be chasing stocks here, but I do, am bullish uh, for the intermediate and long term, actually. One thing that, that caught my eye in one of these surveys is that bearish sentiment or expectations that stock, stocks will fall over the next six months plunged almost eight points to 20.4, that's pretty low. And sometimes that means we're in for a turn in the market. What do you think? A, like a contrary, you mean that, that investors, a turn negative, Sue, is that yeah. what you meant? Yeah, well, I, I actually speak at, at these uh, AI, AAII meetings around the country. I love these folks because they're very engaged in their investment, um, their own investments. But I do think it's important for investors or uh, everyone to look at these, these sentiment numbers as sort of backward looking. Mm -hmm. I get more concerned when the bullish sentiment is over 50 percent because that tells me there's just too many people uh, chasing the market here. Um, but the bearish sentiment, I, I mean, I guess you could say it argues the same, the same response. I'm concerned that investors are going to chase here when they should be sitting back. And then when stocks do get the inevitable correction, as we will at some point this year, mm -hmm. they'll begin to panic and sell. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do. On that note, Nancy, thanks so much. Nancy thanks, Tangler Sarah. with Butcher Joseph Asset Management. More now on those bank earnings that we mentioned. Dow component Goldman Sachs reported better than expected earnings, but revenue fell short. The bank cited lower revenues in institutional client services and its investing and lending businesses. But on the conference call, the CEO discussed an improvement in market activity. In terms of market activity um, and client engagement, uh, we saw a significant pickup in the second half of the quarter. Uh, and, you know, given the environment that we're in, you know, that pickup certainly continued. Now, I, you know, I preface it's only two weeks into the quarter, so it's hard to take any forward judgment on that. Um, but I think that that activity level certainly improved meaningfully in the second half of the quarter. The stock fell more than three and a half percent during trading today. Citi also reported a mixed quarter. Its earnings were helped by share buybacks, while revenue fell amid a decline in equities trading. Citi reported a drop in expenses and is counting on a turnaround in its consumer business, particularly credit cards and retail banking, to increase its overall returns. CEO Michael Corbett says that the bank is making progress towards its financial targets. Shares fell a fraction in today's session. The president of the Chicago Fed said today that interest rates could stay where they are, 
until the fall of next year. Now, that would help ensure that inflation remains at healthy levels. In an interview this morning, he added that the economy is doing just fine. Fundamentals are continue to be quite good, and so anybody who is uh, overly concerned about uh, a downturn, I was never really concerned about that. I, I do think that inflation is a little weaker than I would like to see given strong labor markets, low unemployment rate, wage growth has picked up three to three and a quarter percent. And so there are a lot of fundamentals that support continued strength in the consumer. I'm looking for growth in uh, 2019 on the order of uh, trend growth, which uh, one and three quarters to two percent. So that's decelerating from last year's three percent growth. But yeah, the economy's doing fine. Evans is a voting member of the Fed's rate-setting committee. Some mergers to tell you about. Waste management is buying advanced disposal for about $3 billion in cash, bringing together the number one and the number four companies in that sector. The move would expand waste management's footprint in the eastern United States. It is one of the biggest solid waste company acquisitions in more than a decade. Both stocks rose in trading today. Advanced disposal was up nearly 18%. Drug manufacturer Catalent is buying privately held Paragon Bioservices for a little more than $1 billion. The all-cash deal will help Catalent expand its gene therapy manufacturing operations, a fast-growing area of health care. Gene therapies aim to replace defective genes with healthy ones. Shares of Catalent got a 13 percent boost today. Apple and Qualcomm are facing off in court. The two companies began their massive multi-billion dollar patent trial today. It is a long simmering dispute that will now be on full display for all investors to see. Josh Lipton is at the courthouse in San Diego tonight. Apple and Qualcomm have been fighting each other for more than two years, with billions of dollars on the line. They're expected to be star witnesses from both sides. The best known, Apple CEO Tim Cook and Qualcomm founder Erwin Jacobs. At the heart of this case, Apple claims that Qualcomm monopolizes the market for modem chips, a critical component in smartphones, extracting what it calls exorbitant royalties, and that separately, Qualcomm owes Apple $1 billion. But more importantly, Apple also challenges Qualcomm's patent royalty rate. Qualcomm sells chips, but it also licenses patents for a royalty on the price of each phone. For Apple, that meant paying Qualcomm a royalty rate of $7.50 for each device. They have an obligation to offer their patent portfolio on a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory basis, and they don't do that. They charge exorbitant prices, and they have a lot of different tactics they use to do that. But the chip maker says that Apple contributed virtually nothing to the development of core cellular technology, built its products on the back of Qualcomm's innovation, and is now just trying to pay far less than fair value for Qualcomm's technology. It's seeking more than $15 billion in damages. This case will decide how much Apple gets to keep from each iPhone sold. That's especially important now with iPhone sales under pressure. But analysts say this case is even more important for Qualcomm. Hits right at Qualcomm's highest profit business, uh, which is licensing. So if on appeal uh, they end up uh, losing, that could mean that uh, customers would pay less for their intellectual property and that revenue and profits would go down. Uh, now, I think that Qualcomm has been doing licensing for a long time, and they're very smart about it. I, I do think that they would find a way uh, to monetize it, but we're going to have to see. Jury selection started today. This trial could last until May 15th. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton, San Diego, California. And to another story in the news that Wall Street and just about everyone watched unfold today, and that is the burning of Notre Dame. A massive fire engulfed the Paris Cathedral. Video showed flames leaping through the roof. The fire reached the spire, which eventually fell to the ground. There was no immediate word on the cause of the blade. The structure was undergoing a $6.8 billion renovation project. French President Emmanuel Macron said, quote, I am sad this evening to see this part of us burn. The Gothic structure dates back to the 13th century. It was completed in the 15th. 
Time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Wells Fargo was hit with a number of downgrades following its earnings report last week, including one from Goldman Sachs, which lowered its rating to neutral from buy. The analyst is less convinced that Wells Fargo will hit its financial targets for the rest of 2019. The price target is $48. The stock rose a fraction to $46.77. CVS Health was downgraded to perform from outperform at Oppenheimer. The analyst cites drug pricing headwinds and unfavorable exposure to the managed care business. The firm removed its $85 price target, but despite the downgrade, the stock rose more than 2.5% to 54.22. Nokia was downgraded to sell from neutral at Goldman Sachs. The analyst cites more muted growth in its highly profitable patents business. The price target is 550. The stock closed just above that level at 564. And coverage of Levi Strauss was initiated at a few companies, including at J.P. Morgan, with an overweight rating. The analyst cites the company's mature brand and growth drivers. The price target is $26. The stock rose more than 6.5% to $23.97. Still ahead, the infrastructure issue that few are talking about. Two major industrial accidents, one man dead, both within 30 days around Houston, Texas, and a visit by President Trump. What they may have in common, coming up next on Nightly Business Report. American Airlines has canceled its Boeing 737 MAX flights through mid-August, United through early July. The announcements follow a similar decision by Southwest that we told you about on Friday. As you know, countries around the world grounded Boeing 737 MAX plane in mid-March after two deadly crashes. One of those crashes involved a Lion airplane. In an interview with Reuters, the co-founder of Lion Air lashed out at Boeing's handling of the accidents, saying Boeing treated him as a, quote, piggy bank. Lion Air has spent tens of billions of dollars on plane orders with Boeing. If you've never heard of the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, known as the CSB, you're not alone. It is a small group of people who investigate industrial accidents. But President Trump has been trying to eliminate the CSB for three years, and inspectors have quit. Some fear that's helped to lead to an explosion, a fire, and a death. Brian Sullivan is in Crosby, Texas tonight. Two terrible accidents in just a month, both involving dangerous chemicals, both in Texas, and both may have something in common. On March 17th, a fire erupted at a facility that holds dangerous chemicals in tanks near Houston. That fire led to a leak and forced the Coast Guard to close part of the Houston Ship Channel, one of America's most important economic arteries, for nearly a week. Two weeks later, in early April, an explosion ripping through a chemical plant in Crosby, Texas. One person was killed, two hurt, and schools were locked down to keep the kids from inhaling fumes from the fire. I lived here for a couple years, and you can always smell it in the air, but never as, like, never as strong. So we kind of had an idea, but this happening right now, that terrified me. What the two disasters have in common is a concern that the agency that is charged with investigating industrial accidents, the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, hasn't been able to do its job properly because it's been under attack from the White House. The president has tried for three years to kill the CSB by eliminating its funding. So far, Congress has kept the agency alive. But a number of inspectors have left in recent years. And a former CSB executive says that's making the chemical industry more dangerous. Eventually, there's no question but that a weakened chemical safety board will lead to more accidents happening in the future because we won't have the investigations and recommendations that we need to prevent these accidents. President Trump actually visited Crosby, Texas on Wednesday. He was there, though, to promote building out infrastructure for the oil and gas industry, like new pipelines. There was no mention of the deadly fire. For now, the investigations continue as we speak. There are investigators from the CSB inside the Kimco chemical facility 
behind us here in Crosby, Texas, where one man, James Mangum, lost his life in that fire a couple of weeks ago. But it remains to be seen whether or not in an industry that is worth billions to the United States economy and has been in the headlines for all the wrong reasons, that increased morale toll at the agency, at the CSB, will take its toll on important investigations like the one behind us. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Brian Sullivan, Crosby, Texas. There's a new chief at Best Buy, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The company's current chief financial officer and 20-year veteran will become CEO in June when Hubert Jolie steps down. Jolie was responsible for the electronic retailer's turnaround. He will stay on as executive chairman. Shares fell a fraction to 73.24. Caesars Entertainment is also reportedly close to naming a new CEO, this amid takeover interest in the company. The current head of privately held Affinity Gaming is expected to take the top job. Shares were down nearly 1% to 938. Cannabis company Afria reported a quarterly loss despite a 600 percent rise in revenue. The firm reported a decrease in the amount sold, but an increase in the average selling price. The CEO says the industry is still young and it has a lot of growth ahead of it. I think what's important is it's the industry where it's going. It's a hundred and fifty billion dollar industry growth. You know, Afria will grow to a billion dollars just in rec cannabis sales in Canada by the end of 2020. So it's early on. But the stock fell more than 14 percent to $8.60. The Match Group is restructuring its executive team to focus on its operations in Asia. The company is looking to capitalize on growth outside the United States and Europe. Match owns dating apps like OkCupid and Tinder. The stock rose 5 percent to $60.18. Mattel's shares were lower after its Fisher Price unit voluntarily recalled all of its rock in place sleepers following reports of more than 30 infant deaths. The Consumer Product Safety Commission said consumers should immediately stop using the product. Analysts say the sleeper accounts for 1% of Mattel's annual sales. The shares fell 3% to 1319. Well, once a market leader, healthcare is stumbling this year. According to the Wall Street Journal, the sector is lagging the broader market after being the best performing group in the S&P 500 last year. So let's shine the sector spotlight on healthcare. We're joined by Brian Tankillet. He's the healthcare services analyst over at Jefferies. Brian, welcome. Nice to have you here. Hey, thanks you. Good evening. So what do you think is behind this? I mean, frequently we see when one sector has a good year, the next year it slows down a little bit. But is there more to it than that? You know, that's a very good question. If you look, take a look at the performance of healthcare over the last five years, it's actually outperformed pretty well over that period. But I think this year what we're seeing is the early signs or early um, entry of overhangs from the upcoming elections in 2020. So normally we see you know, the election discussion come up 12 months to 14 mm -hmm. months before the elections. Now we're seeing it about 18 to 20 months a little, a little earlier than usual. So I think that's what's weighing on most of the healthcare sector today. We've also had a lot of activity in the healthcare sector. We've had a lot of mergers and acquisitions. We have insurance companies buying some of the pharmacy benefit managers. How much of that has kind of um, kept investors a little off guard? I think that, that's a good point. You know, on the one hand, you've got, like you said, the pharmacy benefit managers are now owned essentially by the insurance companies, right? Cigna and Express Scripts, Aetna and CVS, United and Optum. So as we see more pressure on drug pricing or more scrutiny in Congress on drug pricing, uh, drug pricing in general, and the PBMs have always been in the spotlight on that issue, now that that target basically has shifted to the insurance companies. Now, the other thing I would say is, as we've seen some of these deals, you know, the question gets asked, why are they doing these transformational transactions or mm -hmm. why are they doing these big deals that are kind of out of left field? Like, are they seeing something that's scaring these management teams? So I think investors are looking into these transactions as potential signs of trouble or concern from, from the industry itself. Is, are there parts of the industry, though, that you are more bullish on than others? And if so, which ones? Yeah, so as we think about Medicare for all and the elections and all these things, right, the, the areas that I'm really bullish on are home nursing. Um, so you've got names such as Ameticist and LHC Group and also the, the clinical lab space. And the reason I'm bullish on these uh, two sectors is that uh, we're continuing to see a shift from expensive building-based settings 
uh, to care, you know, care delivery is moving more to the home and outside of hospitals. And then on the lab side, the market is expanding, market share is moving to Quest and LabCorp, the, the two big names in the space. So I think you're going to see a growth acceleration in those two names over the next few years. All right, Brian, thanks so much as always. Thank you, Sue. Brian Tenkillet, and he is with Jefferies. Well, the next big test for the IPO market is Pinterest. The digital pin board company plans to sell shares to investors and make its public market debut in the coming days. The company is part of a wave of popular but unprofitable startups looking to sell shares. But what is Pinterest and how does it make money? Julia Borston explains. Pinterest draws 265 million users every month, more than two-thirds of whom are female, to find inspiration for everything from recipes to planning weddings to home remodeling. Users save ideas by pinning them to their boards, which can be shared either just with friends or with everyone on the platform. To navigate all this content, pinners can follow friends, influencers, or brands to see their pins or can search for ideas. All of Pinterest's revenue comes from advertising, what the company calls promoted pins, bringing in more than $3 per user last year. Businesses can share images and links for free to their followers or can pay to target users based on interests or keyword searches, putting their promoted pins onto users' home screen or into search results. Pinterest also enables brands to share video ads and shopping ads, which invite users to click to buy. And while Pinterest doesn't take a cut of the sales, the more its ads drive purchases, the more brands want to be on the platform. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston. Coming up, who got the biggest tax breaks this tax season and who got the biggest tax hike? Here's a look at what to watch for tomorrow. A handful of Dow components report earnings, including J&J, &J, United Health, and IBM. The major automakers show off their new high-tech and concept cars at the New York Auto Show. And the Home Builder Sentiment Report will tell us how the industry feels about the state of its business. And that's what to watch for on Tuesday. The mayor of South Bend, Indiana, yesterday threw his hat into the very crowded 2020 presidential race. Pete Buttigieg recently talked to John Harwood about his thoughts on taxes. That's something all Americans are talking about on this tax day. We certainly need to consider a higher marginal tax rate for top income earners. Maybe it doesn't have to be as high as it was historically, but we should at least admit that when it was higher, the American economy was growing pretty well. Uh, we should consider a wealth tax. I think it makes sense. I think uh, one of the uh, things that's appealing about it is uh, it's not very distortionary compared to an income tax, and that's important. The least distortionary tax probably is the estate tax, because you're dead. So uh, another thing we should think about is turning to a, a more equitable use of the estate tax for the biggest and wealthiest estates. And I'm interested also if we can find the right way to implement it, and the devil's in the details, on a financial transactions tax, because you see preposterous levels of wealth sometimes being created uh, around these millisecond differences in financial transactions that nobody can explain to us whether it adds any actual real value to the economy. Buttigieg added that the downside of any tax is that it can disincentivize economic activity. Well, this tax day is the first time that millions of Americans are seeing on paper the impact of President Trump's tax cut. And White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow says the tax cuts have helped the economy. We've got a very prosperous America with low unemployment. Blue-collar workers are doing actually higher wages than we've had in years, and the blue-collar workers are doing better than the white-collar workers, although everybody's sharing in the prosperity. So who's paying what this tax season? Robert Frank breaks down the numbers. It's the first tax day under the new tax code. And while most Americans got a tax cut, there is a big gap between the winners and the losers. The average American got a tax cut of about $1,200 for 2018. Generally, the more you earn, the bigger your tax cut. The middle earners will see a 1.4% gain in after-tax income, or about 800 bucks while those in the top 5% will see a 3% gain, averaging around $14,000. Now, the top 20% of earners got 60% of the benefits. 
But the biggest losers will also be the high earners if they live in high tax states. At least 8% of taxpayers in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and California will see tax increases because of the new limits on state and local tax deductions. And the more your income, the more you paid in added taxes. More than half of all the tax increases in the new law will fall on the top 1%. Those who earn their money from salaries rather than companies or investments also got hit the hardest. So the biggest winners are wealthy business owners and investors in low tax states like Florida, Texas or Washington state, especially if they invested in the stock market and benefited from those corporate tax cuts that boosted stocks. The biggest losers are top earners who make their money from salaries in high tax states like New York or California. Now, the new tax law was supposed to make filing your taxes simpler, but as of April, more than half of all filers used a tax professional, about the same as last year. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Robert Frank. Here's a good stat for tax day. According to Bespoke, stock market returns in the one and two weeks following the tax deadline have historically been positive and better than average when compared to other periods. That might help ease some of the sting if you owed the government money this year. Before we go, here's a look at the final numbers on Wall Street. The Dow was down 27 points, the Nasdaq fell 8, and the S&P 500 was off 1. And that is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow.